Hi, I'm Nick Maselli. At TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, TD Bank, Caldwell University, NJM, Auto Insurance, Homeowners Insurance, and more, with a focus on safety and financial stability, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands, and by Commerce Magazine. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Before I introduce our guest, let me tell you some interesting statistics having to do with uh, veterans and uh, an important need that there is to take care of our veterans. Um, there are over 23 million veterans in the United States, with 2.5 million having just served since 2001. In addition, between now and 2016, over 1. Point, excuse me, 1.2 million service members will be leaving the military, returning to their homes. 425,000 of them in New Jersey. The question is, what happens to their health care needs? Who's providing for them? The two guests we have in the studio right now are dealing with that question every day. We are pleased to have Major General Maria Falca Dotson, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at MD Advantage, and Dr. Al Talia, Professor and Chair for the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Thank you both for joining us. We appreciate this. Um, Maria, we started this conversation at MD Advantage. Um, one of our longtime partners, and we know that, Al, you've been involved in this for a long time. You have served. You understand the need. First of all, how serious are these needs of veterans who come home, and um, what are you doing and your colleagues to deal with it? Well, Steve, first of all, thanks for being on this uh, show. The two of you have done so much to, uh, to make the public aware of what the needs of veterans are, particularly the folks returning from service, active service. The needs are multiple, and uh, in fact, um, they, they range from housing to getting jobs to, to just, you, you can pretty much go across the entire waterfront. But one of the things that we're now even more aware of is the need in healthcare, because uh, there are problems in the existing system, and we're here to, here to help address those problems. Talk about some of those problems in, in specifics. Well, I, there's been a lot of press and uh, discussion about the VA and the services provided by the Veterans Administration, which um, is the largest health care system in the world. They've fallen short, Maria? They, they have capacity issues. Um, I think, you know, as our uh, population has aged that have been in combat, World War II vets, Korean War vets, Vietnam vets, um, that combat uh, force has uh, diminished. Our force is much smaller. World War II, we had 16 million in uniform, mm. and, and today we have 2.5 million in uniform, and that's due to a lot of things. It's the way our budget is generated. It's, it's due to technology that allows it. And so for a lot of reasons, uh, all of those services have become smaller, and yet uh, things have changed in terms of the types of injuries that we're seeing. Like there, well, first, let's talk about the head injuries and the incredible fallout. I mean, fallout's not even the right word. Look at the injuries we're talking about. And I don't think people understand. Someone says, let's fix that. These are long-term injuries. Yes. The, well, every conflict has signature injuries. Sure. So, and they differ. Uh, and the technology has changed to the point where the ratio of killed to wounded in World War II was almost one to one. And For every person killed, there was someone wounded. Yes, it what was. About it's Iraq a little, and a little bit more than that, but it's almost one to one. In today's conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, the ratio is one to eight, and so we have. For every so, person right, killed, there were eight. It's wonderful testimony to the medical care on the battlefield, and then 
being able to medevac those folks out and get them home to definitive care. But it becomes uh, a challenge for the long term, as you just alluded to. Um, and the question is, what do we do yeah. there? And talk about what you and your colleagues have done to jump in and help. Yeah, sure. Just to say a little bit about the VA. Uh, the, the VA actually is an excellent health care system. Yes. I, I don't want to give the impression that they're not. And I would agree with uh, that. Wouldn't you? Yes. And thank you for your service. Have they been overwhelmed? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have they been overwhelmed? I think part of the issue yeah. is the VA, like most of the United States health system, has been primarily inpatient focused on acute problems, right? Inpatient. Inpatient focus. Versus? Yes. Versus the outpatient side. So when our, our folks come back, right, the needs are often in the outpatient arena, uh, subspecialty care, primary care. And although the VA has taken significant steps to boost that system, it takes time. It ch it's an issue of shifting resources from the inpatient side to the outpatient side. And quite frankly, with all the the active uh, combat missions that are going on right now, it's, the system is overwhelmed. So it's difficult for the VA to keep up. And we've seen that in, in terms of the recent uh, problems that, that have been in the news lately. But I think another thing that's important to realize is that 60% of veterans receive, in fact, more than 60% re re receive their health care outside of the VA system in the, pub in the private sector. And that's where I think the private sector needs to step up and really help with the vets, their families, and all the issues that they are confronting. What do they need? Let's be specific and tangible. What do they need? The civilian medical community um, needs to be educated about us properly assessing uh, the folks that come into their practice. I guarantee you that a family practice physician, internal medicine physician, has already been seeing lots of veterans in their practices. They may not realize it because they don't ask the question about their service in Korea and World War but, II but, and but Vietnam. But respectfully, I just want to get but, down to what, are the, what kinds of things do they need? Well, Dr. Talia's um, folks at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School have been on the cutting edge of this. They were the first medical school in the nation to do uh, an all day, actually it was several days last year, and repeat it again this year as part of the Joining Forces Initiative to educate medical students, residents, um, other disciplines, nursing, psychologists, pharmacists, about caring for veterans, about understanding the military culture, about doing an assessment, understanding the effects of conflict and combat, and um, essentially the wounds of war, as as we and hear. And you have and, found that they need. Oh, absolutely, and it's not. It's it's basically a general need within the the clinician community that is caring for veterans in New Jersey and around the country. I mean, to get specific of the kinds of sure. things that we're seeing. Because the, the public needs to know this. Absolutely, absolutely. Physical disabilities, right? Limb loss, a whole series of problems that you get from these, uh, these uh, explosive devices that, that people. So there are physical injuries that they're dealing with, right? In addition, there's incredible emotional trauma that's associated with, with being in combat, right? Um, and then there are the social issues, reintegration back into their families. And, uh, How about employment issues? Well, of Huge. Uh, I'm just talking in turn. You're absolutely right, Steve. I'm just talking about the healthcare related right. things. But the employment issues are huge. Um, you know, retraining. The, there's a whole host of retraining things. Retraining back into society. Into society. Exactly right. Exactly right. These ladies and men come back with incredible stories. I, I can relate to you uh, one story that a veteran told me about. You know, he was starting to open up to his friends about what it was like to be in a combat situation. And you know, there, there was about three minutes of, of, this, of, of talking on his part, and then all of a sudden his friends changed the subject because they couldn't deal with it. They didn't know could how to not deal, deal with could it. Could not deal with so it. So who else would he wind up being? So who could that vet talk to? So what oftentimes happens is they turn to family members, but it's the same issue there, right? Because they've been struggling with issues of their own while the vet has been away. So they come back and it's reintroduction. So it requires a whole host of physical support systems, psychological support systems, and social support systems. And wow. that's where the healthcare system needs to step up to the plate. And so your, your operation, the, from the academic and clinical side, MD Advantage is involved, and other organizations have to be, this has to be a priority for all of us. It has to be a priority for the nation, for every corporation, for every business, for every family, because less than 1% of the nation serves in uniform today. And yet, 
you know, they step up voluntarily and, and go overseas and do their job, and they're willing to lay their lives on the line for that. We and owe this, so, Maria. Yes. We do. Yes, we do as a society. And we if we do. don't do this, if we don't continue to, to, just from a media perspective, if we don't continue to shed light, shine a light, continue to talk about these issues, what is needed, what's not being done, what is being done, what has to be done, we are failing. Our vets, is that not fair only, to say? Not only are we failing, but then we're going to be dealing with the sequelae of not dealing with the problems, right? Yes. Then, then we see families in distress, we see poor work uh, productivity, we see all the consequences of not dealing with it up front. A few Homel seconds, there are practical issues. Homelessness. Homelessness, what else? Ho well, homelessness, uh, behavioral health issues, uh, suicide, um, a whole host and of families problems. families breaking up over this. That will cost society more money. Right will cost us more money if we don't deal with it in a preventive way. It's the right thing to do, plus yes. it's the practical thing to do. Yes. Uh, Maria and Al, thank you so much for joining yes. us. Important work being done every day and Absolutely. more work continues. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Maria. Appreciate thank it. You, thank Steve. you, Steve. Thank you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Mike Ritzius is Associate Director, Professional Development and Instructional Issue, the New Jersey Education Association. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. We're about to see a video real quick. Um, something called Ed Camp STEAM, which stands for? Uh, STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. It's part of our classroom close-up uh, partnership with the uh, NJEA. They have a great series on public television called Classroom Close-Up. There's a video we're about to see that tells the whole story. That's all we need to know, right? Yeah. Let's look at the video, and we'll come back and talk right after this. All right. Teachers love the experience of an aha moment. I mean, and the reality of this experience is it's all endorphin-releasing aha moments. And the only difference is instead of with a, with a student, you're seeing aha moments with your colleagues. And it's absolutely just as empowering and just as exciting. Educators came together to share best practices and explore educational technologies at EdCamp STEAM, an innovative professional development event aimed at exploring the intersection of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. EdCamp STEAM is what is known as an unconference. Free and non-commercial, it has no predetermined sessions. Participants generate the agenda on the day of the event, and all sessions are discussion focused. EdCamp inspires educators uh, because it, it really recognizes them as professionals. Uh, at, a, at a traditional conference, the, the expertise is usually in front of the room running the session. At EdCamp, we say, you're all experts. You bring expertise in a wide variety of fields, and uh, we ask that you, you share that with, with each other. I just want to see what's going on. I, uh, I'm starting an after-school club for, for the kids teaching Scratch. And I just want to see what other people have been doing and, and just take a look at some of the technology, look at Makey Makey, uh, get to meet some people. That's probably the most important thing is the networking for me. This is the opportunity for all educators, administrators, I don't care who you are, I don't care where you're at, I don't care what you're doing. You have the chance to go out and get meaningful, productive, positive professional development. That's clutch. Along with the wide array of discussions, this year's EdCamp STEAM included hands-on activities. So we have a maker space today, what we're calling the Brainery, and that's a section where people are able to try different things on. And it could be something as simple as science experiments that you could do in your own kitchen at home to more complicated of using a microcomputer to watch videos on your old TV screen. We're going to be showing the attendees how they could easily take a simple battery-operated toy and adapt it um, for so somebody with a disability can use it with an accessible switch. So for example, we brought sample switches, so if you had a child who had impaired fine motor control and they couldn't access the buttons to turn this car and make it go, by adapting it through soldering it or different alligator clips, using alligator clips, you can add a port for a switch. So then, then the child could just hit the button or the ability switch and make the car go. People are generally very excited after an egg camp. And, uh, and the nice thing about this type of event is that there's, there's a lot of community building that goes on here. And uh, 
the connections they make are long lasting. So the, the conversations that people have during their sessions and in the hallway, uh, they continue for a long time. And sometimes people make uh, very long lasting professional connections at, at these events and, uh, and neat things come from them. This is powerful stuff. And this is part of an overall initiative called EdCamp, right? Yes. Yes. Who are these teachers who decide to go? Um, it's, it's open to everybody. So one of the tenets of uh, EdCamp is that it's free, it's open to anyone who's interested. It doesn't have to be a teacher. It could be a teacher, a school administrator. We've had parents come in. We've had community members. One of the best EdCamp sessions I ever sat through was run by a corporate trainer from Comcast, and he was explaining how they train their technicians to mm -hmm. be ready to go out in the field. And it opened my eyes as a teacher because I had to understand... Um, the world that my students were walking into once they left our schools. The idea of teachers driving this whole thing, why is that so important? Um, oftentimes teachers feel like the professional development that they receive is imposed upon them. Uh, they feel that it's not necessarily the most relevant. So at an ed camp, uh, at the very least, a teacher can volunteer to facilitate a conversation for an hour and that is going to be the most relevant PD they've ever received. Uh, and then they also have their colleagues there uh, sharing the things that they're doing in their classrooms, and there's a lot of serendipity. There's, there's what do you mean, serendipity? What does that mean? So they're going to discover things that they've never even considered bringing into their classroom. Uh, since, Ed Camp, since Ed Camp's designed the schedule and the content day of the event, um, they don't know what they're walking into. And so they're going to be surprised by a lot of the interesting things that are going to be shared during the day. Hold on, Mike. What do you say to all those that say, you're planning a conference, every minute has to be planned. You have to structure every minute, coordinate it, every blocking. You have to have all the blocks and the coordination and the details, you say? Nope. Don't need it. <laughs> That's why it's called an, yeah. un an unconference. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yep. It's the, uh, it's the opposite of a conference. So a conference, <laughs> like, like you said, it's, a conference can be planned as far as a year out in yeah. advance. And the, What's wrong with that? Well, sometimes those things become irrelevant after a year, and they're not the hot topic anymore. But sorry, anymore. we planned it a year ago. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happen in a year, right? They do. They do. And that's not to say the conference, the, the traditional conference model is, is a bad model. You know, it's, uh, it, the two can be complementary to each other. And if you, if you incorporate this unconference idea where you get people uh, talking about the great things they're doing in their classrooms and sharing uh, the, the pedagogical approaches and the tech that they're adopting and the projects that they're working on, uh, and you couple that with the, the content of a traditional conference, then you get a really powerful you love learning this. experience. I do. I love it. 30 seconds. What's it done for you? Oh, it's changed my whole life. You know, it changed my whole perspective on, uh, on how learning should happen and should be done. And uh, it's connected me to some of the um, most forward-thinking people out there. So I, it's, it's, been a, it's been a huge change for me. Whatever you're doing, Mike, keep it doing it. Making a difference. Good stuff. Stay right there. Glad we have a partnership with the NJEA because we meet people like you. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. It's really powerful. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Catherine Hempstead is Director of Coverage at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Um, let's talk about what exactly has happened since the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, has been uh, implemented. The number of people who are, in fact, um, insured nationally and in the state. Talk about it. Well, we've seen a really big increase in the proportion of non-elderly adults who are insured. And in New Jersey, in particular, we just released some really exciting results from a special survey that we fielded in New Jersey that shows since 2013 we've had practically a uh, cut in half of the proportion of non-elderly adults who are uninsured, from 21% to 10.5%. So that's a really big decline mm -hmm. in uninsurance. Cut in half? Yep. Put up the graphic, if we could, team. Let's put up the graphic. Break that down for us, Kathy. Well, Kathy, if you could tell us exactly why that's significant. Well, that's really exciting, and it's kind of a manifestation of the change in what's going on with coverage in New Jersey, and it shows some of the impact on our providers in the state. So this is some really neat data that we're getting through a partnership with Athena Health, which is a 
cloud-based medical software company. So one of the great things about this data is that it's very, very current. And in fact, it goes through August of 2014. And what it shows is the changing share and the percent of patients and physicians' offices who are uninsured versus Medicaid. And you can see a real convergence of those lines. And that really has a positive impact on providers. And also, of course, it's great for patients. So for the average person who is not a policy wonk, if you will, but cares about the fact, or the fact that we want more and more people to be covered, this is a positive sign, but we do this program at the end of uh, October. We move into mm -hmm. the November 15th to the February 15th second enrollment period. Mm -hmm. What is it that we're hoping for in that enrollment period? Well, I think we're hoping to see a continuation of the great trend that we saw in the last open enrollment period in New Jersey. And there's a couple reasons to be really optimistic in New Jersey. One of the things that's exciting to me is that we have two new carriers that are going to be entering the market. So consumers are going to have more plans to choose from when they go out there to look for their options in the marketplace. So that's... Well, back up. I'm sorry sure. for interrupting. Mm -hmm. Having more options, always better? Well, that's a really good question. One of the things we're very interested in in the foundation is trying to make sure that we're supporting consumer choice in the best way that we can, because this is actually a really complicated choice. There are many different features of the plans, and we're asking people to make a choice that's a lot more complicated than the choice that we might make in our employer-sponsored insurance environment. So yes, in a way, more choice is more to think about. But we're also working to develop plan choice tools that will help guide consumers through the different facets of Say the plans. Again. Plan choice? Plan choice tools. For example? Well, really, it's a web-based application in general. And one of the things we're doing at the foundation, and in fact, we've gotten a lot of New Jersey carriers to participate with us. And so it's a, it's a national demonstration, but it's got a real New Jersey bent to it, is to have people compete to see who can create a web-based application that can best support consumer choice of plan. In other words, let a consumer enter information about themselves, maybe that they take a particular medication, maybe that they expect to use health services a certain amount, and have an algorithm, so to speak, that would sort of guide them you know, seamlessly through all these options and help put them in the place where they can make the best choice for themselves. Is, is it a fact that we, well, should it be less complicated this next time around in terms of signing up and the glitches or whatever you want to call them, the things that we learn the first time around? Should it be easier this next time around? I think it should be, and I think that it will. I think everybody's learned a lot. I mean, this is really a pretty monumental achievement for government, the private sector, and individuals. You know, as we just were saying, this is a really complicated mm. choice, even under the best of circumstances. I think the fact that we have new carriers entering, not just in New Jersey, but there's about 25% more carriers entering nationwide shows that carriers are realizing there's a demand for these products. They think that there's an opportunity for them. And I think sooner or later, the whole insurance industry is going to migrate to a direct-to-consumer environment, not just in this non-group market, but overall. And that might take you know some number of decades, mm. and I'm not going to prognosticate. But I can see that insurers want to be part of that. So. I think it would, we don't know yet, but I think it should bode well for premiums in New Jersey that we're going to have new entrants in the marketplace. Who's left? Meaning those who are not insured as we speak right now and those who are, <coughs> excuse me, that we're worried about not getting insured, who are they? That's a great question. We've just been doing some research with people who are uninsured. And I like to think about it as sort of a stock and a flow. So there are people that flow into eligibility all the time. And those people are, you know, divided into those who are motivated and maybe less motivated, not motivated at all. So when we do consumer research with the uninsured population, we see about 30% of people very motivated, intending to find out what they're eligible for, sign up right away. We see about 40% of people, many of whom sat it out last time, they're persuadable, but they're not sure. And then there is a group of people who, for them, either it seems unaffordable, they don't think it's important, they're very difficult to motivate. And we find the most important things to tell people that we're trying to persuade are that financial help is available, personal assistance is available, and that there is a mandate. And people, many people will have to make a payment even if they don't get insurance, in which case they're paying for nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me, final question. The fact that New sure. Jersey state exchange didn't go that way and relied on the federal government make much of a difference in terms of enrollment? 
I don't think that it did. Really? No, I don't think that it did. New Jersey had a comparable enrollment relative to the eligible population, comparable to New York, comparable to Connecticut. What does that tell you? Well, I think it tells me that New Jersey, uh, New Jersey had a very sophisticated state insurance department to begin with, so I think there was a lot of knowledge there, and it had a pretty highly evolved non-group market before the ACA even started. And New Jersey also expanded Medicaid, which is the most important thing. The Medicaid expansion was huge here. Huge, huge, huge here, huge everywhere. Two-thirds to three-quarters of the coverage expansion we saw, in fact, was Medicaid. Two. So that's a very important part of it. Uh, Dr. Catherine Hempstead, the Director of Coverage at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, I want to thank you and also the Foundation for continuing to uh, um, do important work in this field uh, and help all of us be involved in public awareness. This remains one of the keys to this effort. Thank you, Kathy. Appreciate Thank you it. very much. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, TD Bank, Caldwell University, New Jersey Manufacturers, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by New Jersey Natural Gas. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company offers policies that can protect against auto accidents, fires, windstorms, floods, and many other serious and urgent situations. Tips on what to do before, during, and after you're confronted with the unexpected are on the Emergency Preparedness section of NJM.com. New Jersey Manufacturers, helping the Garden State prepare for the unexpected for nearly a century.